already vested in me by the Senate of York University. I hereby confer on you the degree of Doctor of Laws, honoris causa, admitota ad radum. That's the case. I'm delighted to share this occasion with you. Uh, if you want to get in the middle of us. Mr. Chancellor, Mr. President, colleagues and friends, members of the graduating class, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm sorry to hold up the proceedings. Uh, this uh, great honor uh, got the better of me for a moment, uh, but I understand that it is now my honor to be able to present a short address. Let me begin by saying that I am deeply touched by a warm welcome back to York University and grateful beyond words for the recognition that you give me today. You cannot imagine how gratifying it is to be honored in this way by colleagues who know me, warts and all, and by an institution that was my academic home for so many years. Despite uh, the flattering and lengthy attention paid me, this great assembly of highly intelligent and analytically sophisticated men and women graduating today will sense something fraudulent about an honorary degree, given without examination, without the requirement of long years of work, uh, and in a subject about which I know next to nothing. But despite these misgivings, uh, I am especially grateful to have been given this particular degree, the Doctor of Laws. I'm delighted because for much of my career, I could have been said to be practicing without a license. As a senior university officer, I've been responsible for adjudicating complicated internal disputes and in the most difficult situations for litigation pursued in other jurisdictions. And in all these situations, I have been conscious of my lack of adequate qualification, feeling like the British coal miner in the famous skit from Beyond the Fringe, who complains that he is stuck with the arduous, boring, and dangerous job of coal mining when he would rather have been a judge. He explains the unhappy outcome uh, of his occupational choice or the choices forced, forced upon him because, as he says, I didn't have the Latin for the judging. I too have lacked the Latin for the judging, but now this LLD from York University more than makes up for it, and I am delighted and share with all those graduating today an enormous pride uh, in a York degree. I share also the knowledge that we recognize today not simply our individual achievements, but the debts we owe others for getting us here. Like me, the rest of the graduating class will want most to thank our family and friends who have made it possible for us to stay the course and earn these degrees. And I'm especially pleased that my wife Jan and my daughter Alexandra are with me this afternoon, and I thank them from the bottom of my heart for their love and support which have made my success possible. Thank you. It is now uh, my task uh, to say something inspirational to the graduating class. After many hundreds of ceremonies like this, candidly, uh, I have grown somewhat cynical about in inspirational appeals uh, to finding your passion and living your dream and other tropes of the graduation ceremony. So I'm going to confine myself simply to a few remarks about why I believe all of you graduating today should with me be deeply honored uh, and excited. First of all, you graduate, as has been said, from one of this country's fine universities. Many of you share with me an association with the Department of Political Science at this university, an outstanding leader in the field in this country and abroad. More than from any other source, 
I have learned personally from friends in political science like Bob Cox, Bob Drummond, Stephen Judy Hellman, Ken McRoberts, Lisa North, Leo Panitch, Ross Rudolph, Don Smiley, David Sugarman, and others. And I am joined with all of you graduating today, whether political scientists or not, in an association with a faculty that is unique in Canada for the size, diversity, and strength of its programs in the liberal arts. My greatest enjoyment at York was being dean of the then Faculty of Arts, in regular contact with so many great scholars in so many different fields. So I know that all of you graduating from that faculty today in the liberal arts have no fear of being stuck with coal mining uh, or the metaphorical dead ends associated with it, but that the, all, your degrees in the liberal arts will open up opportunities and excitements that you cannot now imagine. Beyond our shared experience of the excellence of York's academic programs, there are two other defining characteristics of this university for me which have shaped my career and I'm sure will shape yours. First, York has been a uniquely open and inclusive institution. In its origins, it stood out against the anti-Semitism and other social exclusions that typified established universities. And true to its origins, York has continued to be a leader in struggles to make our universities truly Canadian rather than many replicas of foreign institutions, to break down sexist and racist barriers to the fullest participation in the life of universities, and to break down the walls of orthodox claims to a monopoly of knowledge by creating innovative programs of transdisciplinary research and teaching. My career has owed everything to this culture of openness and inclusion. I came to this university a new Canadian, albeit one who could hide easily behind the color of my skin and my comfort, despite my accent, in the dominant language. But I'm sure that I would not have enjoyed the same degree of acceptance and opportunity at any other university. And I'm confident, looking at the rich diversity of the graduating class today, that all of us have cause to be grateful to York for the openness and inclusion that have made our success possible. I also had the opportunity at York to move from my academic specialization into new areas of interdisciplinary scholarship. So I know intimately the advantages of York's translation of principles of openness and inclusion into exciting curriculum and research, into the production of knowledge itself. And I'm sure that you, my fellow graduates, will come to realize the importance of York's institutionalized open-mindedness in your future careers and success. And the second defining characteristic of York for me has been its commitment to collegial governance. This is an ancient principle underlying the academic freedom and autonomy of universities. And it is a principle that is threatened by external political interference and by the internal evolution of managerial and administrative control. At this university, however, the defense of collegial governance has been uniquely strong, despite the tensions it sometimes produces. Only at this university, I suspect, would an anti-establishmentarian labor lawyer have become its greatest president, and in my view, one of the greatest presidents in Canada's history. Only here could an instructor in mathematics become an assistant to the Dean of Arts, then vice president of administration, and go on to become president of two of our important institutions. Only at this university could a relatively junior economic historian, not yet a full professor, become a dean of arts, its largest faculty, and go elsewhere to become one of the country's most successful presidents. Only here could that dean be succeeded by a former secretary of the faculty association and then a former president of the association. And only here, I suspect, could it be true that of the very small group of deans and vice presidents with whom I worked in a single decade, no fewer than 10 went elsewhere to more senior positions as often as not as presidents of other universities. This last observation can be interpreted in many ways, but I think it speaks to the profound impact of a strong system of collegial governance on the incubation of university leadership. 
I owe so much to having been brought up in this institutional culture, and I owe everything about university governance and collegiality to friends and colleagues at York, like Harry Arthurs, Michael Creel, Bob Drummond, Shirley Cates, Sheldon Levy, Harriet Rosenberg, Ross Rudolph, David Thompson, and others. Most of you graduating today will find references to collegial governance a bit obscure. But I believe that you will have learned some of the core values of collegiality simply by being students at this university. You will have learned that respect for others and respect for difference is fundamental to our well-being in community, just as the love of others and the subjugation of one's selfish interests is fundamental to our flourishing as individuals in personal relationships. You will have learned that free speech and free thinking must be protected even when they give offense, and that only behavior which obstructs this freedom should be restricted. And you will have learned that dialogue and an empathetic ear are more effective instruments of understanding than the invocation of authority with a rhetorical dose of slight or superiority. And finally, you will have learned that negotiated agreements and coalitions are always stronger and more durable than the assertion of will, the imposition of force, or the reliance on shared identities which are never stable. These, at least, are the lessons that I learned at York. And I accept my York degree today in humble recognition that whatever success I have achieved reflects more than anything these lessons. I thank all those colleagues, family, and friends who have made my achievements possible. And I wish all of you graduating today the same good fortune and wealth of opportunity that I have enjoyed as a result of my time at York. Congratulations to you all, and my very best wishes for your future success and happiness. Thank you.